Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, Tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. On today's episode, we have an extra special guest, Dr. Paul Early. Dr. Early has been an addiction medicine physician for 36 years. He treats all types of addictive disorders and specializes in the assessment and treatment of healthcare professionals. He is a distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, ASAM, and has been on the board of ASAM for over 20 years in several capacities, including being the president. Dr. Early has also received the ASAM Annual Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Growth and Vitality of Our Society, for Thoughtful Leadership in the Field, and for Deep Understanding of the Art and Science of Addiction Medicine, and for Expanding the Frontiers of the Field of Addiction Medicine and Broadening Our Understanding of the Addictive Process Through Research and Innovation. Dr. Early is a dynamic speaker and educator. He has trained therapists from all over the world on the topic of addiction and its treatment. He is the author of three books and numerous articles on addiction and its treatment. Today, we are focusing on his book, Recovery Mind Training, a neuroscientific approach to treating addiction. Paul started working in the field of eating disorders and recognized that among some of them, food addiction was playing a role with these patients as well. We are so excited to talk to him about that. You are in for a treat today as Paul explains how addict brain works and why the cycle of addiction is so hard to break, why we can't just stop even though we desperately want to. Pay close attention to his explanation of procedural learning. We hope this not only helps remove the shame and blame of addiction, but also helps you appreciate that this disease resides in our brain and our brain is who we are. It's what allows us to think, breathe, move, speak, and feel. It's our own personal mission control. Because of this, we must do some level of daily work to treat this disease and have a recovery mind in order to keep it in remission. Listen to this episode a few times. There are some serious, powerful takeaways. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. I am your co-host today along with Clarissa Kennedy. Today we are talking to Dr. Paul Early. Dr. Early is a addiction medicine physician for 36 years. He specializes in training healthcare professionals and is the current president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. He has trained therapists across the world using the neurobiological understanding of addiction. He is author of Recovery Mind Training and the Recovery Skills Manual, for recovery mind training. The value of his approach for us at the Food Junkies podcast is that he provides a detailed systematic platform of tools to help us in the field of food addiction and recovery. So hello, Dr. Early, and I already see that I didn't catch everything that you've done. So if you want to take it from, give us more of an introduction. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here, Vera and Clarissa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I don't have much more to say but than that. Just it's been a, a wonderful career of combining uh, my science interest with my treatment interest and my compassion for those who suffer. Well, and you were saying something about food. Uh, you have been working in the area of food, um, eating disorders or something. So tell us more about that because I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. So I was originally trained in uh, neurology and developed an interest in uh, psychotherapy and uh, those who suffer from illnesses that are outside the domain of traditional uh, neuro neurological care. And so I started working in a program that treated um, men and women who had anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. The program over time began changing into folks that had food addiction without those two components of the illness, without the huge weight loss issues or the uh, binging and purging of bulimia nervosa. So I've had, that's how I started. That's how my actual interest in addiction began was working with uh, those that had food addiction. 
And over time, um, we also began working with uh, individuals that had simultaneous alcohol or drug issues. And I followed that thread, if you will, into the more traditional addiction uh, field after that. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, Okay, well, so in a nutshell, uh, how do you see your approach with addiction medicine, either with food addiction or just in general addiction medicine as different from the traditional model of addiction medicine? And is your view representative of ASAM or are you outside of that model as well? Right. So um, recovery mind training has several components to it. Addiction care is not uh, well systematized and recovery mind training is not about treating everything about an individual who is suffering from an addiction disorder. For instance, it doesn't focus on or even have uh, ways of working with uh, improving depression, which often occurs with addiction disorders. But it's a way at getting at that core process of compulsivity, of an inability to see the problem, of decoupling what feel like very automatic behaviors of an addiction problem and addressing those things in a systematic way. The thing that makes recovery mind training a little bit different, uh, there's several things. One is that there are ways of looking at the whole spectrum of the addiction phenomenon, parsing out the elements which you see in the individual before you and focusing on them with systematic interventions that are aimed at those specific problems. For example, some people may have uh, an an eating disorder where they clearly recognize that they are out of control and that they need to do something about it, where other individuals have a mechanism of kind of hiding it from themselves, that thing we call denial. Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't have the denial component, you don't need to treat it. But if you do have the denial component, then you have a task at hand, which is often quite difficult to uh, to bring to the fore and help people get past. Okay. So that's the one piece. So that systematic part right. and the interventions are systematic. And then the last part about it, which is somewhat different, is the participant participates in evaluating their own progress simultaneously with the, with the therapist or the treatment community that they're in so that they have a better understanding of what is happening to them. One of the biggest problems with addiction care, in my experience, is that um, individuals come into an addiction treatment setting and they're kind of swept into a system and they themselves can't even understand what's happening to them. They just kind of go along with it and hope something changes. I think that's a bad idea. I think a better idea is to help individuals say, do a self-assessment, and then that self-assessment goes to the therapist that's working with them. They do the simultaneously uh, simultaneous assessment of each of the little s- steps of treatment. So everyone's on the same page in understanding what needs to be done, what ha- needs to happen next, and that in turn determines the length of, uh, of the, of the uh, application of this model in helping people get better. So if I if I'm understanding you, the the understanding about addiction may be the same as other addiction physicians, but what you're offering is a unique systematic model of treatment that even the client can follow along with. And certainly be, between therapists, we're, they're all speaking the same language, the same terminology. Correct. Exactly. Everyone's talking the same terminology. Right. Everyone, every you know, everyone kind of it's really clear what the next step is. And at the core of it, recovery mind training is, is about, uh, is about learning uh, how to undo negative behaviors. Mm. And in, and instead of judging people, uh, instead of saying um, you have no control over your compulsive binging on food, or you have no control of your alcohol use, instead of going that way, you say, this appears to be a problem. Do you agree? And, you know, and if the individual says no, then you have a different kind of problem. But if they say yes, then you systematically walk through that and people understand their process of doing that. So you have a more of a partnership. And the whole process is about, is, is about learning what are called uh, programmatic, lear- uh, 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 programmatic learning the, this, the kind of learning that's in, involved yeah. in riding a bicycle versus 
knowing factual information, which is really useless in the yeah. data. We're, we're going to get into that a bit more. Um, I, so so uh, right from the get-go uh, in your model, it seems that you make a real distinction between what you call an addict mind and then a recovery mind. And so can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by addict mind? Yeah. So the addict brain is um, is really, it's, it's our belief, those of us that helped develop this model, and I was kind of the primary fellow, but we worked together with uh, six or seven therapists to work on this is that once the, the biggest problem with addictions is they literally retrain the brain to think in a different kind of way. And that different kind of thinking is, a, is almost like an autonomous or a, a distinct set of brain circuits that work to the demise of the individual. And so it, it gets... What if if an individual accepts that they have an addiction disorder, by the way, you have to get people to that place before they're going to understand addict brain. Mm -hmm. But this addict brain is is the composite of all of the maladaptive programmed procedural learning that an individual does in the course of an addiction. And, And literally, it's my belief that any truly addictive phenomenon involves rewiring of the brain circuits. And so what we have to do is rewire the rewiring, if you will, and and help people undo the damage that's caused. And that's the addict brain. And then recovery mind is a set of skills that people learn to return themselves to health, to combat this, uh, this, this process. The reason I came up with this dichotomy is for, is because it helps people understand or categorize a particular behavior as self-destructive in a way that's not self-blaming. They can say that that's my addict brain, which keeps on wanting me to expose myself to friends that are using substances or being around food when I'm vulnerable or going to parties where people are drinking when I'm trying not to drink. That's the addict brain part. And the recovery mind would part is to say, okay, if you have that tendency to do that, what do we do next to unwind that? Okay, so you know, there's a couple of things that come to mind when you when you the, the, the language that you use makes me think of term, the terminology that comes from operant conditioning or sort of that psychology. Is that is that where this comes from? Yeah, operant conditioning is part of procedural learning. Yeah, and, um, exactly. And again, procedural learning, just for your listeners, it's really important. To, human beings are really good at procedural learning, as most actually most animals are as well. And it involves multiple, multiple circuits in the brain. Uh And once you have a procedural process, which is acquired by procedural learning, such as um, if you learn how to, uh, one of the things I love to do is ski. Uh, I don't ski every day. Uh, Unfortunately, because I'm getting older, I don't ski every year. But even though I haven't skied in two years, I can get on skis and I can do a fair job of something I learned because I entrained my body to know what to do. I don't have to sit there and say, now, do I lean to the left? Do I lean to the right? How far back should I be on my skis? How do I walk in these darn things? I get on the skis and my brain literally knows how to do that. That's the part of the brain which is deeply entrained in addictions. Right. And that's why it's so hard to undo it. Right. And, and I, I, I was going to ask you that later, but you brought it up now, this, that sense of the, the how versus the why, and that uh, we're working on the how part and forget about the why yeah. uh, and the understanding of why it's, it's about the how. Okay. So, so the, the other thing I heard is that it sounded almost as if you were saying the addict mind was a mind in like a separate mind in the mind, uh, almost like, I don't know if you know, Bitten uh, Johnson's work where she calls the red dog, the addicts. It's almost like there's an addict within us or a gremlin with something within us. Would you go as far as to say it can look like that? I absolutely would. I think there is an autonomous uh-huh. Please part of your brain, which is always the, the human brain is amazingly vast and amazingly complex. And there, there are people, for instance, um, the numbers aren't as large as we used to think, but there are people that literally have multiple personalities within them, for instance. It's a rare phenomenon, but it occurs. And that's, although that might be a, a somewhat sad illness to have to work with, it's a testimony to how complex the brain is. And so much of what we do as humans is unconscious. 
it's beyond our, you know, beyond our access to it. Just like getting on my skis, I don't have to think about how to ski. In a bigger sense, if I had an addiction disorder, I wouldn't have to say to myself, you know, my it would be an automatic behavior to overdrink, to binge on food, to to not have an off switch on my eating behavior. That's an, a process which is almost beyond this part of us that we call ourselves. Uh-huh. It is like a red dog, as you say, or it, it, it's very, very similar to that process that there's there's something going on in the head, which is out of our control. And, and it really kind of makes sense because no one, when you take a look at people with addiction, no one sets out to be so self-destructive, right. yet they do. And, and it's baffling to the person that's sitting across from you in the therapy session, or it's baffling to the person that has it. But it makes sense in terms of the fact that a part of their brain is literally has a totally separate agenda. <laughs> right. So, so I, I've never thought of it this way, but um, can we actually make a comparison or a, an analogy that addiction disorder is like a kind of a form of multiple personality, except it's basically two personalities, the, the me, the self, and then this other thing inside that seems to run the show sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a, it's an interesting analogy. I wouldn't go quite as to say it's totally parallel for this yeah. reason. Uh, but, but I, but let me kind of expound on that because it, I don't think I've ever thought about it, but so the difference is the multiplicity that the two places is in the consciousness area and multiple personality disorder, whereas okay. the two places is more in the behavioral area. Okay. Uh, in, yeah. in, in behavioral areas of our brain for addiction. But in the sense that there are two control centers. Yes, you have that term in there. Very it's a second control center, the addiction. Yeah. Yeah, I exactly. love that term. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, so so the other thing I didn't think about asking you this either, but when you were working in the eating disorder piece, you know, one of the areas that we struggle with uh, in, the, in uh, food addiction is how to distinguish and, and diagnose the difference between eating disorder and food addiction. And there you were coming from the eating disorder area, realizing, no, there's something here that I want to call food addiction. And so how do you determine the difference? What's your, in, in terms of using this language, <clears throat> this platform? Well, I, that's a really super question. And I, I don't think I have a, I want to be start off by saying, I'm not sure I have the most exquisite way of doing this, but I'll take a stab at it with you. Yeah. I think whether it is, it's often difficult for people to decide if they have an alcohol use disorder or if they are just over drinking because of current stress, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the same thing with food addiction, people will come and say, you know, uh, I, I, um, I'm, I'm eating because of stress, because that's the, you know, let's say that's a common reason that people do overeat. So one of the ways I differentiate between the two is when there is a wholehearted concerted effort on the part of the individual. And I don't mean a half-hearted kind of, yeah, I should probably, you know, every night I binge on this amount, I, I should probably just eat it you know, eat half as much or something like that. Or, you know, um, I, I, I shouldn't go into a binge blackout from, from eating too much, or I shouldn't uh, drink. But, but rather when people say, I have made a decision, a concerted and clear decision that I want to change this behavior. One of the best ways I think of differentiating is when you have that, you have a sense, and, and usually the person doesn't have it, but the individual treating them who is an expert in the field can say, yeah, this is, they're really at a place of being serious about this. And if they are able to adapt their behavior for a prolonged period of time, then I say that's a a behavioral problem. It's not a food addiction. But if despite their all of their best efforts, Ah. they wind up falling into a pit of despair because they cannot control it, then it's an addiction just like it would be with alcohol. If you had an alcohol issue and someone couldn't stop. So when patients came to see me as an outpatient, Uh, as a therapist in the field of alcohol addiction, one of the first things I would do is I'd say, well, so what's, what do you want to do about this? And they'd say, I want to stop drinking for a month just to see how it is. Okay. Let's stop drinking for a month. Mm -hmm. And and we sit down and say, that's the contract. And uh, I know this sounds crazy. I'm sure you guys do it, but you say that that means everything, right? No beer or no, you know, no alcohol, no wine, no Jack Daniels on Saturday night. 
And we kind of drill into it exactly what it is, which is very analogous to the food addiction world, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> Where people say, I shouldn't do this, but they really have a lot of withholds. So you get all of that written down, and then you continue to see the, the individual asking how it's going. And if, if despite a concerted and honest, genuine effort, the illness is beyond their control, then it's by definition an addiction. And, and I think that fits for alcohol addiction. I think it fits for cocaine addiction. I think it fits for narcotic addiction. And I think it fits, fits for food addiction. Is okay. that it, it's, it's all about, and, and there is, I believe, a difference between an addiction disorder and a bad habit. Uh-huh. And, and it sounds like you're putting the eating disorder piece in a, not so much a bad habit, but a behavioral response to something that's not an addiction per se, maybe well, I, previous I, trauma or. Yeah, I, I really saw um, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa as, especially bulimia nervosa as, as in my work, I saw it as an addiction phenomenon. Now yeah. there's lots of yes. um, there's lots of psychological and psychodynamic things happening with eating disorders that are mm. anorexia nervosa and bulimia, absolutely. But the there's nothing more addictive than the binge purge cycle. It's just so similar, and 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 because uh, you 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 know you 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 binge on high caloric foods, which activate that. A reward center in the brain, you have a visceral reaction against it. You eliminate the food and the elimination creates a second wave of uh, brain neurochemistry, which reinforces the process. So it's a deeply addictive phenomenon in my book. And anorex nervosa is, is I think very, very complicated and often has, especially for women, has a lot to do with women's roles in society changing and what it means to be a woman and, and that sort of a thing. So I don't want to ignore all those things, but there's nothing more addictive than someone has bulimia. As you also, if you take a look at the natural history of bulimia nervosa, uh, young women who are bulimic have a, have a 80 per 70, 80% probability of developing an alcohol disorder if they drink alcohol. Uh-huh. But, I mean, these are these are the at at the core of this. This is the same illness as I see it. Yeah, I mean, would would I be pushing it uh, to to say that you um, might? Well, I'll say I'll we'll speak for ourselves that there's a lot of there's a lot of misdiagnosis with uh, eating disorder that it may actually be some sort of addictive disorder. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and especially if you take a look at the research, um, how you can activate high levels of dopamine in the mesolimbic dopamine reward system is by taking certain drugs, drinking alcohol, or, or uh, a, a bolus infusion of, of glucose. Exactly. And it's just as potent okay. as uh, alcohol. So, I mean, it, you know, it, it, I used to say to my eating disorder patients, well, you know, you're doing the same thing. It's just, you figured out a way to do it without having to go buy drugs to do it. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Right. So, Okay, so so you're you're acknowledging there's a dis, dis, distinct disorder that's called addiction or or addict brain, and uh, you mentioned something called the incentive salience model. Can you elaborate on that? How does that fit into this? Yeah, there are a couple of different models um, that uh, for addiction disorders in terms of brain neurochemistry, mm-hmm. and the the incentive salience model is basically one where the the uh, use of drugs, it's, it's barely been only studied in drugs, creates a, creates a positive experience as it does in anyone. But some people are very sensitive to that positive experience. Yeah. And so what happens is that reinforcement to reenact it uh, causes them, incentivizes them to repeat it in a way which is more dramatic than people who don't have addiction disorders. And so that's that. That's the one model about incentive salience. And uh, there's lots of research which shows it's, it's, uh, it's very, very important. There's another model brought forth by George Kube, who's really a, a, you know, one of our stalwart people in the addiction world, that talks a lot about the uh, avoidance of the negative consequences in driving the addiction. So um, the negative consequences tend to 
uh, to drive the continued use because of the um, because of the problem. And it, where does the truth lie? It's it's um, who knows, but it's both negative and positive reinforcement in the mm-hmm. mesolimbic dopamine reward system stimulate the um, the the addictive dr- drive, if you will, and it, it almost doesn't matter which is the which is the leading. Uh, the leading culprit, if you will. Um, and it, it may be that both of them are active at the same time in a given individual. Uh, I, I, the research is, is, is a little unclear. Yeah. I, I would think that it could easily be that it started off with the positive reinforcement and uh, and then gradually, as you become more and more tolerant and dependent, then it, then it shifts over to the uh, the negative one where you're just using so that you don't have to go through the withdrawal. Like I think they're both, they both work well together. Yes. Okay, I don't know if this fits, but this. It, so the idea of your of uh, you're saying that the more exposure, the more um, more potent the drug becomes, right? Almost like an allergic response. Yeah. Well, there is. Yeah, it, it's there's lots of for traditional uh, drug addiction. I don't know if there's good research on food addiction, but for traditional drug and alcohol addiction, there's clear evidence that some people have a genetic proclivity or genetic susceptibility to this problem. And it's probably true for food addictions as well, Hmm. but it's not as hardwired in that. And and there's even some suggestive research that we're beginning to see which genes actually control that that's work from uh the genetic research that comes from iceland actually um Uh. on because they've they've done so much work with genetics and they've looked at their population and those that develop addiction and don't and found that uh there are certain gene types which uh genetic sequences if you will or genomes that that put place people at a much higher risk of developing addiction disorder, and those are ones that, not surprisingly, have to do with the development of brain functioning, especially in the more deeper, more primitive areas of the brain. So that places one at risk. So if you take someone that has a high genetic risk, and you have a certain amount of exposure, yes, it it lights the fire. So you need to, in the genetic model, you uh, you have this genetic risk as if the kindling is already quite dry and quite flammable yeah. and all you have to do is light the match what, what about in a society like today where um uh even if there is no previous kindling there's no genetic predisposition but th- there is so much exposure i mean when i was a young uh, kid i didn't eat the way that young kids eat now and and uh, my my uh, sense of this is that there is so much exposure that we don't even need a genetic predisposition. We're already building uh, <laughs> right. uh, gateways all over the place. Would you agree with that? Well, I certainly think that 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 what's human Homo sapiens was uh, you know designed or evolved in a time of food scarcity, and we don't know how to deal with food excess, and we certainly don't know how right. to deal with excess of simple carbohydrates. So one could posit that that's at least a, a, a part, could be a huge part of it, um, the, the possibility that, that because we evolved, we, we evolved to seek out high caloric foods because of survival. Yes. And then we go to a culture where there is high, high caloric intensity and in small amounts of foods with taste augmentation. And it's a you know, Katie bar the doors, it's a disaster for us. And one would sense that food addiction would be worsened in our society simply by what we're doing in the, uh, you know, the, 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 the people that are the plotting against us, if you will, are the people that have figured out better and better ways of making tastier stuff with high caloric loads. That's a, that's a double whammy. You activate the taste buds and at the same time you activate the, the, this mesolimbic reward system with high caloric loading and um, the brain doesn't know how to deal with it. Just like, by the way, the brain still doesn't know how to deal with opioids, doesn't know how to deal with cocaine. It doesn't know how to deal with methamphetamine. Those things are dangerous for some people and some people may be more sensitive, but what you do when there's more and more people that are doing it is you definitely <laughs> ensure that Everyone that's susceptible gets in trouble. <laughs> but what's your what's your sense since you brought up all these deadly uh, um, addictions? What's your sense of where food addiction fits in the hierarchy of uh, 
severity. I mean, you know, opiate addiction is deadly because you could die tomorrow from a fentanyl overdose. Food addiction, my sense is it's a slower, but just as deadly. What's your take on all that? Yeah, I think food addiction is more insidious in my in my mind. And it 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 can also lead to people thinking that it's not as much of a problem as it really is. It's almost like the, the, the issues with opioids are unavoidable because people are overdosing and dying today. So yes. I, I think it's captured, at least in the States and probably in Canada, um, it's captured everyone's attention because it has an immediacy and the immediacy makes it seem worse. Now, is it worse? Not necessarily because the insidiousness of a slow boil of a food addiction or an alcohol addiction or a, you know, or a tobacco addiction kill actually, you know, tobacco kills many more people than, you know, than alcohol or heroin combined. Yet we don't say we need to make tobacco illegal, um, which would make total sense. I mean, you want to save billions of healthcare dollars, you would just eliminate tobacco. But so I think the insidiousness of it keeps us from seeing its true import. I like the term that you use. It's a slow boil. That's what it is. It's a slow boil. I like that term. The concept of choice, where does that fit into this? Before we talk about recovery and recovery mind, you're going to hear a lot of people saying, um, you can just choose to stop. So what's your take on that, especially in relation to food? Yeah, so I'm going to use the analogy that I'm that I've already pounded into the ground with you. It would be like saying to putting someone on a bike and say, "Forget how to ride that bike." Okay, you can't you can't unforget you can't unforget you can't forget procedural learning. It is so hardwired in the brain in multiple um, centers, and it's way below consciousness that you can't unlearn it. You have to instead learn overlay it with separate behaviors that that correct or twist the 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 self-destructive behaviors so choice goes away that's when we were talking earlier about how do you differentiate between someone that has an addiction and someone that's just say yeah. um, you know using food because they're lonely well you know if someone makes a very concerted effort and they can't stop it that means it is programmed procedurally in what's called procedural learning. And at that moment, choice goes out the window. The only way you correct it is with addiction treatment and addiction treatment that's aimed at reprogramming those, those, deeper, uh, those deeper behaviors. And that fits right into our next area of talk, which is the recovery mind. Uh, yeah, you know, how, what is your platform? How is that different than the... Uh, I mean, you mentioned you have a, a whole set of tools. So just give us a sort of general, what does, what does it mean to retrain our brain towards more positive? Well, so the first thing one does to retrain the brain for recovery is to not rely on information. Huh, good. Huh. Elaborate, uh, please. You can't talk someone into recovery. You can't teach them about what's going on in their brain and have them go, oh, okay, that's good. I just won't do that because you can't not do that. It, it you know, procedural learning becomes automatic. So um, my patients say, you know, I knew I wasn't going to, uh, I knew I wasn't going to drink alcohol, and I went, um, you know, I was in the the larder or the closet. And I found a bottle of wine, and before I knew it, I had my hand on it, and I was I was putting the corkscrew in. And I poured myself a glass, and then I looked at it and said, "What am I doing?" You know, wow. that's all procedural learning that is uh, that is replicating a hardwired process and below the level of consciousness. So, what do you do? Well, in that simple case, you say you have to get all the alcohol out of the house because if you have the alcohol in the house and you have an alcohol use disorder you're going to drink. I mean, it's simple. And that's a very overly simplistic thing, but that's one of the things you do. But in recovery mind training, what you do is overlay a series of behaviors on top of the maladaptive behaviors. And you don't do that by putting people in a classroom and talking to them. All of the skills, recovery skills people learn are done through experiential therapy. Now, it may not be 
you know, deep psychodrama or what I was trained in is psychomotor, which is a, a, a cousin of psychodrama. It's not necessarily like that. There are a series of procedures. So for instance, the first thing you do in recovery mind training is you get people to, to look at some of their high risk situations. Well, a high risk situation is um, uh, I'm gonna, going to be going to a wedding. That's exactly what I have what an I alcohol saying. problem. Yeah. Or I have a food problem. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's, you know, this is best done, obviously, in a group. And, and, and you actually role play the whole process of what would happen at the wedding and say, okay, let's, you know, you have some objects that you just say, these, this is food, this is what we're doing here, this is that, or this is alcohol, we're going to put a glass here, and here's a punch bowl that has, and here's champagne bottles, and you put some bottles on the table, and the therapist has someone in role play as the uh, the individual with a problem who's who is going to have to go to a, a wedding, and then you have other people act in the wedding. And what happens in, in a wedding? People say, "Oh, this is so great! Have a glass of champagne," and they shove it in his face. Well, okay, so then you stop and say, "What are your choices here? And how am I going to stop this? What am I going to do? Am I going to walk away from the table that has food on it? And am I going to sit in the corner and talk to a good friend of mine who's also going to be at the wedding?" Or am I going to say, no, thanks. I already ate. How am I, how, or what am I going to say? I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want anything to drink. I'm fine right now. And then you have them actually say that and do that. And then the other person who's offering it pushes it harder and harder. And you have to teach people how to do. And when, when they go through the process of uh, behaviorally walking through the avoidance, it's totally different than sitting in a therapy room and saying, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to go to the wedding and I, I won't eat food. Okay, well, how are you not going to eat food? Well, I'm going to do this. I don't believe that works. I think that the really thing works when you move the body and the body walks through the process yeah. and the brain engages with the body and you figure out. Um, so, uh, so things are just going. for our uh, listeners, um, I think what you're referring to is, is your sort of uh, platform of domains. The domain A2 looks like domain F where... Um, you know, the first one is you make the template. You, I think you get the systematic approach. No, I'm sorry. Uh, addiction containment, get rid of the alcohol, get rid of the whatever it is. Uh, and, then, and then there's a recovery skills and then there's emotional awareness, internal narrative, connective and spirituality, relapse prevention. You have a whole set of tools which look like it could be a week by week sort of thing. Yeah, and, or, or even longer. I mean, yeah. I've had patients that... <laughs> they take six weeks to, you know, develop a, a system of containing their illness, and and okay, that's fine. Even in a, in a, in a even in a residential setting, so again, that's you you move people at the rate at which they they can do that. Uh-huh. And some people will take this like a fish to water, and other people will say, "Well, I, I I'm here, aren't I? So I'm I think I'm going to be just fine. I just I just had to show up in your therapy office, or I had to show up at your treatment center, and yeah." And that's enough, isn't it? Well, no, no, <laughs> no. unfortunately, I, I'm sorry to tell you that's not. Yeah. And so th- that's the other cool thing about it is it is, it is each person moves at their own pace. Right. But it's and some people. Very, will, yeah. It's very systematic. And it's like, you go from one to the other, to the other. And it sounds like with doing with a lot of uh, um, procedural learning with each stage. Exactly. And, and it, by the way, just because they're A through F, um, that doesn't mean you go A through F, but it does mean the first yeah. thing you do is with an addiction disorder, we were talking about that differentiation. If there is a true addiction disorder, yeah, I think containing the illness, put, putting a fence around it, making sure it's not running, running, wreaking havoc in your life is the first step to do the real rest of the work. Yeah, you know, I was um, going to ask you about that. So yeah. so you wouldn't be somebody that would say, let's work on the trauma first and then you'll be able to stop drinking. That wouldn't be your line. That would not be my line. Now, that yeah. doesn't mean that you can't begin to talk about the trauma right? and validate the trauma and, and, ins- and create a sense of safety using something like seeking safety or one of those other methodological tools that will create a a safe place. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you have someone that has profound trauma, as many people with addictions do, you almost have to stabilize them enough in their addiction recovery 
to have the emotional strength to to kind of work on the the really powerfully disruptive and agonizing work of recognizing and working through the trauma, whether that's, you know, using EMDR, whether that's um, those sorts of things. So, yeah, I, I don't, I think that you can recognize it. I think jumping in there first, if the addiction is out of control, is just a guarantee that the addiction will get it more out of control. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, because that's, that's our stand for sure that we need to seek abstinence first in order for the rest of the platform to work. Is there something in um, your platform that you think, uh, have, have you used this for food addiction per se? I have not. And I would be lovely to try that out. And I can't right. wait uh, to work with you guys and figure out how we might adapt it. There are nuances that are going to be obviously different. Uh, one of the difficulties with food addiction is, it is as, as you guys know, it, it has some qualities which are different. I can say to my patients, I never want you, the, the mo, very most obvious one is I can say to my patients, it, it, you know, you can't drink any more alcohol, but I can't say to people, you can't drink food. So we have to figure out for each person, that definition of what is yeah. healthy, uh, non-addictive eating. And that takes a while to get to that place. And there, and it, it, it's, um, it, it, which, which makes, I think in many ways, treating a uh, food addiction much more difficult than, than alcohol and drug treatment. Right. Yeah. So identifying what are the triggers basically. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you have any thoughts on um, the concept of harm reduction in the addiction world and how that might apply here? Or what's your thought about it in, in terms of your perspective? Well, harm reduction is what we've done with people with addiction disorders is we blame them and hurt them. And many people are not at a place for many reasons that, they, that they're ready to, to get better. And so harm reduction is, in my mind, is all about keeping people alive, first of all. And I have no problems with with, with every attempt to keep people alive, because I never give up on my patients. And if they come to me and say, I don't want to do that, I don't, I am not an expert, for instance, in working out uh, harm reduction in a given individual. That's just because I haven't had enough experience with it. But if they come to me and say, uh, I will, I want to, um, I, I want to figure out how I can um, use heroin and not get uh, HIV not get hepatitis B, super, let's get you to a needle exchange. Mm -hmm. That's fine with me. And if you need my services, then I'm here. So just because I don't do that kind of work doesn't mean it's not invaluable. And that's also true with food disorders as well, I think, is that uh, if there's a way you can keep people from getting medically ill while you are helping guide them to self-awareness to go through the stages of change from pre-contemplation to contemplation to action, then you are um, helping people as well. There's nothing, uh, and, and harm reduction shouldn't be thought of as the, oh, well, you're not willing to do this, so you're not a good person, so I'm going to do this. That's not true. People are at different stages. However, the, the hard part about harm reduction is to figure out when you have the window to move someone yeah. from harm reduction to working on remission of their disease. And, and the, the, only pro, the only thing I have with harm reduction is, the only concern I have is, is worries that you miss opportunities if people are in that model to intervene on helping people move through the stages of change and say, I, I really am ready to do something about this in okay. terms of remission. The model that you're speaking of is um, like we kind of identified behavioral, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's procedural. Where is your take uh, on medication in relation to this? How does that fit into that? Do you um, are you talking about medications for, uh, for uh, chemical addictions? Yeah, well, even for uh, food addiction. Well, food addiction. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I have a little bit wider experience with medications. I am perfectly fine with people, uh, especially with opioid use disorder, uh, being on buprenorphine, being on injectable naltrexone, being on methadone. Um, everyone is different. Every patient I've had is different. 
And there are times where, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a provider of methadone maintenance. So I, if someone comes to me and says, I'm not ready to do that, I won't necessarily accept them at the, accept them blindly at their word. I will encourage considering them, uh, their options a little more, but nonetheless, some people, um, this goes to this issue of remission through uh, medications, whether it's uh, naltrexone, buprenorphine, or methadone, it saves lives, and people can return to productive lives yeah. on those medications. And I have no particular, you know, I'm fine with that as being a way of approaching it. It's not what the center of my wheelhouse of what I do. Uh, so I often will say to people, let me find someone who's the best uh, in my town to have that but done. Your, your model would, would could coexist beside it, I guess. Yeah, I could coexist with that. I, I think I would probably the, the I think that the psychological changes that go yeah. that go along with deep addiction recovery are assisted when when if it's an opioid addiction the opioids aren't in the system it's a little harder to do to do that on for instance buprenorphine maintenance but that is a type of containment and can be used and right. i'm fine with it it's just a little more difficult just as it would be difficult uh, in in food addictions as well if someone was uh, i think in food addictions you would constantly be massaging closer and closer to abstinent eating over time and and set the goal without judging your patients if they are not proceeding at the pace that you think they should be at, which is difficult, right? Because we want everyone to just grab the, the brass ring and go for it. People have to go at their own pace. So the, the, and the problem, again, with the other parts of recovery mind training is it often works best in an environment where the disease is fully contained. For instance, if people are, reg are doing regulation of affect, their moods, their feelings through food behaviors, and they're continuing to do that while you're working on emotional intelligence, you're kind of going against, you're going against having uh, the deepest understanding of that because they're busy using their old food tool yeah. while you're trying to teach them a second tool exactly. around emotional resilience. Yeah. And, and speaking of uh, the tools, another one that you have is connectedness and spirituality. And I really want to make sure we get this question in. And that is, how does the 12-step program uh, complement or work with your platform? The 12-step program is deeply integrated into, into recovery mind training. And, and that doesn't, there are people that for which 12-step recovery does not work. The advantages of 12-step recovery in my mind is that it creates a wholesale re-engineering of the individual. It, it's a profound kind of journey that people go through. And, and that- We call that spiritual awakening, but I like this wholesale engineering. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it is spiritual awakening. I, but people, for, for people that are, you know, I, I treat a lot of people that are reluctant to, you know, to dive into the spiritual, uh, you know, they don't want to hear that. But I say, well, how about if you just completely- felt totally different about yourself. Yeah, I'll go for that. Okay, uh -huh. well, I got something for you. Uh -huh. it, it's just, it's a little, I'm just trying to be a little tricky, if you will. Yes, yes. With, with people who find the spiritual awakening part of the 12 steps to be difficult to swallow. So yeah, it's deeply ingrained in it. And um, some, of, some of the people, and I use those tools for the very reason that it, it encourages everything one needs. Uh, it encourages self-insight. It encourages inventory of what one's past. It uh -huh. encourages seeking a higher meaning in your life. And that helps free you from the bondage of the uh, addictive behavior when you're these seeking. Are all, these are all your domains, right? That you're yeah. listing right now. Yeah, yeah exactly. So would it yeah. be fair to say it's like a secular version in a way? Yeah, although yeah, although I, uh, I again in in the book uh, in recovery mind training, there basically they do twelve step work. Um, there are you know they work steps, they do all that kind of stuff, and um, I encourage my patients to work steps, find a sponsor, uh, look for spiritual values if they have already have a faith to reestablish that faith, and maybe in a subtly nuanced new kind of way, which often happens. So I always encourage that. But the nice thing about it is for people that say, I don't want to do that, doc. I say, we're, we're going to work on these other things. 
mm. and we're going to connect you with other people, whether that's rational recovery, whether that's, um, you know, a, a, you know, some other type of tool, which creates connectedness, which then backdoors its way into spirituality. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's, that's very clever. <laughs> so you've been around the block here, you 36 years, I think you've been in the field of addiction medicine and yeah. it's, Things have changed a lot in the last, especially the last 10 years. Um, how, how does your model fit now? Um, are, are, is it something that's becoming more accepted in, the, in ASAM, for example? Or, or like what's politically, what's happening? What's your take on that? And, and I'm asking that just because there, it, really the last three years, things have really shifted. Yes, they certainly have. Um, ASAM's, ASAM's agenda with physicians is really to do the best job with what physicians do best in the world of addiction. And we don't, physicians are part of a multidisciplinary team. And so what ASAM is dedicated to is doing the right thing in the things that doctors do best in addiction medicine, which would be helping people detoxify, mm -hmm. which would be figuring out uh, if medications will help, which would be making a diagnosis of a co-occurring co conditions such as depression or bipolar illness or personality issues, which need to be done, especially if they're an addiction psychiatrist. So that's what ASAM is focused on. And then the other piece that we're, we've been doing for many, for really that I'm super proud of is we've been taking something called the ASAM criteria, which is a, a way of structuring intensity of treatment yeah. And, and defining what those pockets of treatment are, figuring out people, how people move through a continuum so that treatment is not seen as a, you know, for lack of better terms, I'm going to say a 30 day wonder where, you know, you don't go to treatment for 30 days and you're better completely. I mean, you, you might be better, but if you don't do something after you're done with that, you've wasted your time and your money and you'll be back where you started from. Addiction is a chronic condition. It takes, in my experience, it takes almost five years for people to completely extricate themselves from the clutches of all of the crazy unconscious behaviors they used to be. And what happens during that time is, I'm sure you have all have seen as well, is people start recognizing it. What the most common thing I hear my patients at four years is they say, they, 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 and they often say this to me, they'll say, Doc, I got a secret for you. What's that? And he said, they lean forward in the session, they say, I was a lot sicker than I thought I was <laughs> as if I'm shocked by that. Right. Uh -huh. And, and it's because it takes so long for people to see the truth of how damaged they were, how destructive the illness was. And that's really super true for food addiction as well. Absolutely. Super true for food addiction as well. And, uh, and in some ways that's another sneaky part of that food addiction is because uh -huh. If if you're you know selling your 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 furniture to buy heroin that your fa so your family has no furniture at home, it's kind of easy to say this is pretty bad. But if you are if you're just slowly destroying your body and your all of your whole way of dealing one amputation at a time, for example. Yeah, it's diabetes. hard to see that truth. Yeah. Because yeah. you hide it from yourself progressively better and better over time. Yeah. So, so that actually leads to one, uh, one of the last questions that I want to ask you is, as addiction physicians, I still don't get a sense of, thanks to Nora Volkov, uh, we, we, we have put food addiction or sugar addiction on the map. I mean, thanks to her. I applaud her and her work. But it, it still doesn't seem to be something that addiction physicians, you know, we're, we're saying society doesn't take it seriously. It doesn't seem that addiction physicians do either. How can we, either through ASAM, through you, now that we have you, or how can we get uh, this to be taken more seriously in the clinical world? I think that there's several things we can keep doing is teaching. Yeah. See, I had an experience that I shared with you earlier. Yes. Because I started the field in this area. It's kind of like I, I was deeply inculcated in understanding that addiction is bigger than just a drug or, or an alcohol or a cigarette. It was, it's, it's a, it's a maladaptive. And, and that's also true for the, for the behavioral addiction, such as, gambling or sexual compulsivity as well, right? I mean, yes. so, 
but that came easy to me. And some people, physicians are a little concrete at times. Okay. So let's just put it out there. And, and so um, when you come to them and say that, there are two reasons why they might have resistance. One is it's, it's has, you're stretching their conceptual boundaries a little bit. Yeah. And two, the other thing I learned working in the food addiction world is everyone had, no one has a normal relationship with food. Mm. And so everyone, when you start challenging that with people, it's, it's a little threatening at times. Yeah. And so, um, so, uh, so I have, uh, you know, if you have some, you know, because everyone has an abnormal relationship with food, it's a little scary. It'd be a little bit like if everyone had, if everyone had, and you know, the people that have totally normal relationships with alcohol, but it's if everyone, if everyone yeah. had an abnormal relationship with alcohol, then yeah. all the addiction physicians wouldn't see it. Right? Exactly. So there's already an inherent uh, defensive bias. That's there's happening. a defensive bias that's there. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think education is helpful. I think, I think to, to uh, I think within ASAM um, to keep uh, uh, th- there's an increasing interest today within ASAM about dealing with the behavioral addictions. And I think yeah. um, having educational things within our forum would be helpful because we need to get physicians on board with this. It's a huge problem. I it is, it, and it's, um, and it's, it, it is, um, and I've even heard physicians say, well, I'm not going to worry about that now. I'm just going to try to get them off of alcohol. Well, no, it's all the same thing. Yes. Well, I'm and if really you get them off of alcohol, their food addiction is going to get worse. It's it's a. I like to talk about addiction as being, uh, is is like playing whack a mole. You know that game of whack a mole. You knock down one addiction, the other one pops up. And mm-hmm. we've seen that with behavioral addictions, people become compulsive gamblers when their alcohol dependence goes away, and, and, and are compulsive sexually or compulsive with food. So if if we start treating addiction as a problem of the human brain, not substances, yes. then we're going to get some traction. And I think we're close to that now, but more work needs to be done. Yeah. Um, well, and so that, yeah. I, I, I want to give the floor to uh, Christy now, but I just in conclusion, I want to say thank you so much for um, speaking to this. And I, I want to, you know, make an apology to the listeners. Your work is very intricate. And, and uh, I, I, we really just touched the surface, uh, really just saying that I, I guess I can conclude that your, your uh, manual is almost like a, uh, well, secular or systematic uh, way to achieve that spiritual experience through the back door. Um, and, uh, but there's much more depth than what we, what we've been able to speak to today. So please Thank you check it out, uh, especially the counselors who are listening, because there's some great tools. And um, I'm so glad to hear the president of ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, acknowledging that food is uh, part of that whack-a-mole system. So Chrissy, take it over. Thank you so much, Dr. Early. It's been like, So fantastic to just listen to this conversation between you and Vera. And we have a signature question and it is, if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about addiction, what would it be? Wow. Or food addiction. Or food addiction, you know. I would say that um, everyone during, almost everyone during their lives is going to struggle with a behavior which is potentially lethal. Everyone. Everyone. Sorry, I'm interrupting. So go into it with your eyes wide open. And Vera, thank you. I love the way you you weren't interrupting. You were you were kind of mirroring that, which was super. Everyone has a problem of an abnormality around some area of compulsivity. That's part of the human experience. And I would say to that younger self, just know that that's the case. So when it shows up, you can go, oh, there it is versus what's what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me is not the way to approach it. It's, oh, there it is. Okay, now it's time to start making sure I'm not going to go down the wrong path. Oh, that was a beautiful answer. I loved it. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us today on the Food Junkies podcast. It was great being here with both of you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. 
Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.